Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today we're going to be talking about ways to make the Novus Ordo better. That's right. We're going to look at the documents of the Second Vatican Council, look at what was intended with the liturgical changes, and show how the, the Novus Ordo can be celebrated beautifully and reverently in any church you go to. The celebration of Mass should be beautiful, and I think there's simple ways to make the Novus Ordo great. Good to be back with another episode. This is uh, obviously something I think a lot of people are going to want to dive into. Um, there are certain things that I think we've all encountered at masses that um, make our skin crawl or make it cringeworthy, we mm -hmm. should say. Um, but but where is that fine line between those things and then what what the Vatican Council called for in the renewal of the new order, the Novus Ordo. I think it's I think it's important to realize that that Latin phrase "Ecclesia semper reformandum est" in a constant way. The church is always in a state of reform, and we have to keep that in mind throughout every generation. And I think it's time for a sense of reform liturgically. And it's not that we have to invent something new, but retain things that that really the church never intended to go away. Yeah. Almost a reform of the refer reform you'll hear said sometimes. But, you know, a lot of what people mistakenly associate with why Vatican II and the Novus Ordo in their mind is deficient is not really what was ever called for. Those are liturgical novelties that were not called for. No permission was granted to do them. And the experimentation has given a lot of uh, what the Mass should be a bad name. I don't think that there's particularly anything inherently deficient in the Novus Ordo. Now, you'll hear that argument a lot from the proponents of the Tridentine Mass that, you know, it's a, a lesser version. And there might be some truth to that the Tridentine Mass has a more, I guess, deeper spirituality, but that's maybe just for some people. Now, I personally attend the Tridentine Mass, but I also go to the Novus Ordo, and I've seen it celebrated incredibly beautiful, yeah. incredibly respectful, and the Novus Ordo has produced saints. So it cannot be inherently deficient if it has the sub, the sacrifice of the mass, the true presence, and and creates saints. Mm -hmm. There's no question that the the validity of do this in memory of me mm -hmm. is is absolutely intact. And when we celebrate that universally and it's affirmed and promulgated by the Holy Father, you know th that's what makes it. That's what uh, consists of our universality. That's what consists of our communion with the Holy Father, and that's that's very important when. When we're in communion with our bishop, when we're in communion with our Holy Father, and we celebrate the do, do this in memory of me, um, you know, that has that uh, been celebrated differently throughout time, mm -hmm. you know. But these core elements are, are very important, and there are ways, especially what we're about to share with you, ways that you can really beautifully celebrate the Mass uh, with some beautiful customs and, and pieces within the liturgy. Yeah, I think we have a modest proposal for how we would lay out or the um, the order of a idealized uh, celebration of the Novus Ordo. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Ways that any Novus Ordo church, any Novus Ordo liturgy could be celebrated beautifully with just a few small changes that incorporates what Vatican II, I think, really was trying to uh, achieve in in um in their in their documents, and I think the first one that we should talk about is uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium. And if you want to understand what the fathers of the Second Vatican Council were intending to achieve, this is the first document to read. Yeah, Sac Sacrosanctum Concilium, uh, something that I remembered, you know, without even when I saw the uh, document on the list, I remembered the references to Latin mm -hmm. and Latin chants. Mm -hmm. So. You know, the document expresses, nevertheless, steps should be taken so that the faithful may also be able to say or to sing together in Latin mm -hmm. those parts of the ordinary of the Mass which pertain to them. Mm -hmm. So your sense of like, holy, 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 sanctus, sanctus, sanctus. It's, that's a big part of... <laughs> they cut it out. No, they don't. They don't? No, you gotta stop that. Oh, I thought they cut the no, mic out. No, no, no. Who is they? 
<laughs> <You know? laughs> they, the Dude, you gotta stop rattling that. It's so distracting. <laughs> get a get us like plastic cup. Uh, then it's gonna sound where it's gonna well, sound. I'm done, so uh, we're good. <laughs> all right. Okay. <laughs> okay, daddy. I don't know. All right. All right, all right I got it. Sacrosanctum Concilium, right away, you know, off the top of my head, remembering reading this throughout the seminary, something that stood out for me was the use of Latin within the liturgy and Latin chant specifically as well. And the document expresses, nevertheless, steps should be taken so that the faithful may also be able to say or to sing together in Latin those parts of the ordinary of the mass which pertain to them. So you think of like the Sanctus, mm -hmm. the Holy, 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 or the Agnus Dei, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You know, when you when you roll that out in a community, like we sing the Agnus Dei every single yeah. day during during the week, and then during Lent, we sing the Sanctus and the all of the Latin parts yeah. of the ordinary. And it's beautiful. People appreciate it, and they get into it. That's right. And I think that's one of our first recommendations is that there is some elements... Even if the Mass is in the vernacular, which is Most granted, you should have these Latin elements for these very important parts of the Mass. So for the Agnus Dei, mm -hmm. that should be in Latin. The Sanctus should be in Latin. And, and furthermore, I think the, the Kyrie should be in Greek, right? Now, that's even going back further in liturgical language use. But those are three small parts of the Mass that are not hard to say in Latin. Mm -mm. Pretty much every church I've ever been to, Nova Soda or not, they know how to sing that in Latin. Mm -hmm. That's an appropriate thing that gives, number one, a better musical setting so that you don't have these kind of, you know, Peter, Paul, and Mary versions of the Sanctus, right? Because they can get a little bit out of hand. But this is really easy. I mean, you do that in your church. I mean, mm -hmm. does everyone know what to say? Yeah, I mean, after you sing it for a while, it's even it, O Salutaris or Tantum Ergo mm -hmm. for, you know, exposition or benediction, people pick up on it very quickly. And it's kind of fascinating that people would pick up on it quickly and memorize it. But, you know, I've just recently were printing out uh, stickers for the back of the hymnals so that the Latin chants are more easily found. Instead of flipping through pages, mm -hmm. we're just we're just printing it out and putting it on the back of the hymnal. And, and you're not this mean traditionalist who only must speak Latin. No, you? and I'm no Latin scholar either. I mean, I took yeah. I took some Latin classes in in college, but you know, I like to include Latin because it's the language of the church, and and, and, and it will it, remain to be the la the language of the church. I mean, we are the Latin rite, and Sancto, Sancto Sanctum Concilium even says that Latin should be preserved in the liturgy, mm -hmm. and this is a good way to make that ground. Now, again, a lot of that ground had been seeded, you know, in the seventies and eighties, but I think now that we're settling down, you know, through the culture wars, hopefully, some of this can be brought back in, and it's an appropriate time, and I think everyone should. I mean. Can you, can you, so explain what the Lamb of God is when it happens for people who not, are not sure and then how to say it in the Latin. Sure, sure, sure. So, so the Lamb of God takes place before the Ecce Agnus Dei, before the priest upholds the blessed sacrament with the, cha, with the chalice and the host. And he says, behold the Lamb of God. That is the Ecce Agnus Dei. And then what happens prior to that is the Agnus Dei. It's, it's calling out to the Lord to have mercy. So Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy, have on, mercy us. on us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have, have mercy, mercy on us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, grant, grant us, us peace. peace. Sure. And now everyone who's we been mad, know everyone knows yeah. that. Now, even in some very modern progressivist church, mm -hmm. You'll still hear the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God, in Latin, and it's not hard to learn. It's so not. how does that go? It's not. Agnus Dei, qui tolis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. Agnus Dei, qui <laughs> No, that was different. That was a different generation. <laughs> Ryan yeah. Delacrosse is playing the guitar. Right <laughs> yeah, that's now. right. So there's there's no guitars with the Agnus Dei. This is this is a simplex chant. Yeah. It's so it's a good segue. simplex. Yeah. It, what does that simplex it, it's mean? It's basically uh, it's basically a a simple form of the chant that can be followed by the congregation. Mm -hmm. The ideal is full conscious participation. Right. We we want everybody to participate. And chants create the range that most people's voices can right. hit. 
mm-hmm. as opposed to complex, mm-hmm. which would be all over the place. And um, there'd be more arrangements yeah. too within that. Chain. So you're saying Ryan can sing it? Ryan can absolutely sing it. So you want me to put the guitar Ready, down? Ready, hit Put it. the guitar. Yeah, put the guitar down. No guitar is <laughs> chanting. What about the bongos? Can I get the bongos out? <laughs> Dude, don't get me started. All right, sing us for us. Okay, so uh, so the second is exactly like the first, the second uh-huh. phrase. Hong you stay, qui tolis pecata mundi, miserere nobis. Hong you stay, Qui tolis peccata mundi, dona nobis pacem. And, and again, it, you know, you do this for a few weeks, everybody's going to know it. That's right. Yeah. You know, everybody at Daily Mass, everybody's singing, singing and participating uh, with the Agnus Day. So that's an easy way to make the Novus Ordo. That's right. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's a it's a small way to make it a lot more now, engaging what are we, and beautiful. What are we accomplishing with that, right? So, what what are your thoughts? A more Latin right? Yeah. So you're tying yourself to your identity mm-hmm. because right. we are the Latin churches, mm-hmm. Sacro Sanctum Concilium. You're also out. bringing in chant, which mm-hmm. we'll talk about later as part of this document, this mm-hmm. Vatican document that um, mentions this explicitly. You know, mm-hmm. as part of of, of mm. this. Well, I mean, that document order. says that chant should have the place of primacy. Primacy. Yeah. yeah. And then you, you b- talked about guitar. So also in there that it says, I believe, I think it's 110. Let me make sure I can find this. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, 120. In the Latin church, the pipe organ is to be held in high esteem. Yes. For it is the traditional musical instrument which adds a wonderful splendor to the church's ceremonies and powerfully lifts up man's mind to God and to higher things. So that's the intention of these. It's not to be snooty. It's not to be aristocratic that, well, we speak in Latin and we play an organ. It's never about that. And if it's about being aristocratic, if it's about being better than someone else, you're losing the purpose of it. Well, that was Latin it. and this music mm-hmm. is to draw your mind higher to God, yeah. not to put yourself distanced from other people. Right. And the, I mean, that, that was a, a big uh, part of that generation was just any anything that was an authoritative figure that they they were the ones rewriting the books and you know you look at it and like i i went to my mom's parish in florida um and i i mean i was just it was appalling like the the music was just appalling and and it was really about those people playing the music mm-hmm. so like reading this is it's almost like reading chinese to them yeah. right they're just like hey I've got a guitar, I can play music, I want to perform. And and so what you've done is you've you've taken our church and its tradition and, and all the things that are I mean, part of our history and you've basically usurped it. That's right. That's a good word is usurp. You've usurped it all to uh, and it and it all is for your own good. It's not even for the good of the people in worship. It is literally a very very selfish thing to do. Uh, especially in the liturgy, it makes it even more selfish. You no, know? There, but there's some. And I'm people... not saying that they're consciously making that selfish decision. But <laughs> at some point, somebody should step in and say, "Hey, look, like this is this is our church. This is who we are. This no. is why we do these things." And educate them about it instead of just give them willy nilly. Like, yeah, go ahead and do your thing. Yeah, you and know? and again, there's some people who very much have all the greatest intentions in the world. Yep. But then there's others who are, you're right, who are making it about themselves. Like, look, I'm a field musician, and the only time I get a gig now is Sundays, oh, you know? Yeah. And, and, oh, yeah. And that's, look, it's a human nature. But, you know, using the organ instead of the guitar when possible. I mean, it's not always possible. Sure, especially you know, with daily mass. Like, I mean, your, you know, your cantor, she plays guitar, and it's amazing. Mm-hmm. It's, and it's very appropriate, but it's done tastefully. Mm-hmm. But when you can have the organ or it, it's... It's a different oh, setting. But what's what's powerful with Gracie, the the music director here, is she's she has progressed from using the guitar to the piano, and you could see a notable difference. Mm-hmm. And it is a step in a more noble direction. And then the piano to the organ. Mm-hmm. You know the the organ has this beautiful capacity to lift you to the divine presence of God yeah. 
And and it absolutely, when you think of the sound of the organ, it's like it's church. Mm-hmm. I'm in church. I'm in church. Mm-hmm. And it's it is an instrument that is unique to the church and elevating the people of God in communal, congregational worship and and singing. Yeah, you brought up a good point. It's unique to the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of you know allegory in the way that it produces music. You know, a piano or a guitar uses strings. Okay. And they're percussive in nature, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. whereas the organ is very, it can be very legato. Mm-hmm. It's using air to push these notes through these pipes. Mm-hmm. It's very, you know, inspirited in that way. You know, mm-hmm. it has a lot of, uh, I guess, the sense of a musical ruah almost, right? Yes. So it really does sound differently. So that's the second suggestion is... Organ. Let's get an organ in yep. there. Yeah. They're, they're, it's very achievable. There is hundreds and hundreds of people in your parish who took piano lessons, who know how to play an organ. Mm -hmm. You can find one. I guarantee it. And while we're on the topic of of instrument and music, what we need to return to the church's practice is real bells. We went into this phase of like digitized bells Mm -hmm. with speakers, and there's a very clear and distinct difference between real bells and what we have in a greater majority of churches that have been built after... The Second Vatican Council. So, you know, returning bells where you're hearing the tolls. Like I was with a Benedictine monastery in Salem, France, learning Gregorian chant. And when you're worshiping with them within the liturgy, you're hearing these bells ring at the beginning of Mass and then at the consecration. You're hearing different pitches and tolls. It is very, very powerful, and it draws your attention. So even like the use of Sanctus bells, you know, where you hear holy, 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 you're hearing the bells ringing. It's Pavlovian. Yeah, it is. And and it does. It, it reaches into your consciousness, and it draws your attention to something that's sacred that's happening. Yeah, well, and well, the, As you're building this church mm-hmm. in suburbi, suburban Florida, like, what— where where does this come into play as like noise pollution, for example? Because mm-hmm. there's, I I think there are people that have complained about churches and a lot of uh, well, they instances. can just eat it. Well, no, I mean I'm just saying like what, what where does that sit with you? Mm-hmm. I know you're you know the sheriff's a parishioner and you've got you know friends and places here. Like what what is the are you planning on getting bells and ringing them loudly or what? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not saying to do it obnoxiously, <laughs> you know, like that would be that would be terrible. It should be accented beautifully. And and most people, generally speaking, love the sound of a European piazza and a bell yeah. that is tolling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and, you know, to have it toll at noon for the Angelus is a beautiful thing. Now, we yeah. have an episode on church bells coming up and the theology and the, the tradition around those. But bells really are for a community and, and they always had been, is basically a public broadcast system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When the bells ring, how they ring, how many times was very communicative. And it's also, again, show it takes the whole community under that one voce mm-hmm. of a bell, which is a sacramental. So mm-hmm. we'll show a whole episode on that coming up here in a few weeks. But yeah. it's an audible sign of the life yeah. of the Christian community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, but you also mentioned the Sanctus bells. Mm-hmm. Those are cheap. What does it cost? Yeah. 50 bucks. Yeah. Give them to your altar server. And during the elevation, ring those. Are there are there parishes that don't ring those bells? A lot oh, of them. Yeah, many. Ma- probably a majority don't. Mm-hmm. Wow. Right? And that's I don't a simple. I've ever been in one where they don't do that. It's a simple thing that you can add. Mm-hmm. You know, like a little bit of Latin, having a little bit of chant, bring in the Sanctus bells. They're yeah. very simple things, but they elevate the liturgy to a much more reverent and. F- if the goal of Vatican II was to get the participation of the people in the liturgy, those are the things that draw the person in. A bell, you know, ring, ring, time to pay attention, right? Mm-hmm. The organ envelops you. The chant captivates your soul. These are easy things to do mm-hmm. that makes it, and this is and this is without having to go back to a church that we never knew, or the Latin mass of the 1930s. Yeah. This, is a, this is a bridge to... Maybe, you know, properly celebrating that hermeneutic of continuity in the Latin church, which at times has been ruptured with the liturgical novelization, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's not being ultra-traditionalist here. Like, the organ is the premier instrument of the church. And that bells have been intimately tied with the calling to prayer 
for Catholics throughout every generation. So Latin is our language. Latin is our language. Chant so is our style. The hermeneutic of continuity is everything in respect to this. And it, and it's not it's not let's go backwards. It's let's go forward and let's not leave behind this practice. That's right. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm really starting to get chills here about being a Roman Catholic. You know, I'm starting to realize that this this part of my faith is very important. And then as I start dwelling on that in this conversation, I'm also realizing like all the sacrifices that were made for yes. all the original people that were in this Roman mm. culture, like that, like this is this this is my lineage. These are my people. These, these are the people that that have fed me today. Mm-hmm. You know, and and so it's your honoring, liturgical patrimony. It's, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right, patrimony. Yeah, that's I it. mean that's what I'm experiencing right now. Is just like this sense of heritage now that, yeah, I, I just I I. I you know, I've, I see the beauty in it because my my pastor has brought in the Novus Order the way it, uh, I, I believe the way that we're talking about now. Mm-hmm. Um, beautiful mass, uh, kneelers, everything. And before it was a lot different. And like, it's it's beautiful and I'm captured and captivated by it. And it's very reverent. And I, I feel a, a, like we're, we're raising our voices and our liturgy to God, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the purpose of it. But the, the patrimony of our right this is what I'm starting to experience in the heritage that's there that I'm really very proud of. And, and when you look at the the decades and centuries of musical development and in that sense of what you're sharing in patrimony and how your heart feels that all of these people sacrificed and gave so much for this mm-hmm. development, you know, it's important to see, hey, these people did this for, for us. Yeah. What type of service is it if we just... Completely disregard it. Disregard it. I mean, it's even. We've got to open up the treasure trove of sacred music within the church too, and bring that to the forefront of our practice. Well, tradition is the democracy of the dead, and that's Mm -hmm. the way that all of our forefathers and all of our ancestors still get to say and have a say in how um, our culture is inherently grounded to our tradition. They still get to have a say in how the life of the church operates. There's nothing operates. wrong with that. If, no, if it's, anything, it's, it, I would say it's it, it's wrong to ignore that. Ignore it. That's it's, fundamentally wrong. It's horrible. All right. So to recap, those are the first three ways. Look, getting a little bit more Latin in the church, right? Yeah. You know, whether it's the Agnus Dei, whether it's the the, the uh, prayers of the consecration, which you could say are the secrets. Mm-hmm. Those could be in Latin. Um, it's using chant when appropriate. It's having church bells because those are something, you know, inherent to our culture. And then also bringing in the organ when possible. So that's four solid ways of making the Novus Ordo more what is intended to be, but also to properly praise and glorify the Trinity. Now, here's another one. And Father Rich, you do a good job at this. I think, you know, as a Novus Ordo priest, you do an excellent job of having beautiful vestments. You know, so often you'll go into a Novus Ordo church and it looks like, I'm sorry, a purple tablecloth you know, yeah, on their or shoulders. or a green one. Or a green yeah. one. Or it, or they're gaudy in the wrong ways, man. They look like, yeah. they look, you know, they look like 1970s furniture upholstery. They're not beautiful, right? And it's not so that the priest can, you know, have lavish garments. He's not wearing these out in the town, right? This is for, in, for the celebration of the mass. So... You know, the dignity of the in persona Christi calls go. for it. Mm-hmm. You know, and when you look at the most ascetical, austere, and, and most impoverished saints in the history of the church, and St. Francis of Assisi and uh, St. John Vianney, and how they upheld the importance of vestments being beautiful, mm-hmm. it, it, it's something to really strongly consider as it relates to some of these kind of thrown together vestments. Um, it's just, it's not. It, it, it cheapens the celebration. There should be an appropriated liturgical vestment with the vestments for your altar as well. You know, just as you wouldn't expect a parishioner to show up to mass in jeans and a and a, and a football jersey, you shouldn't expect the priest to show up wearing, you know, tennis shoes and a tablecloth, right? I mean, there's some on both sides. Now, we did that full episode on vestments, um, and we talked about the theology and, and how they are— um, symbolic of certain things, but you know, you have nice vestments. I like your red set too, especially mm-hmm. with your cope. Mm-hmm. That's a really nice set that you do for like your, you know, Eucharistic expositions mm-hmm. and things like that. Well, I, I received all of those from a uh, Eastern Orthodox priest who donated 
all of those vestments, um, those copes particularly, yeah. to the mission grounds, and they were passed on to me in patrimony, um, which I cherish, you know. But and and I don't want to put them in a museum. They're old, you know. They need to they need to be put into practice. How old are they? Oh my goodness! They, they, there's no like year on it, but you could tell that they're probably hundred, you know, hundred a plus hundred plus years old. Yeah, mm. you could tell that they stand out. But mm -hmm. look again, that's an easy way. Look, my son, when I take him to mass and he sees a priest in beautiful vestments, it stands out. You know, he's five and he sees that and he's like, "Is that the Pope?" Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. or you know, when he sees a, you know just a plain thing, he's like, "Oh, okay." It, it's it's something about the setting. It's about giving your best, and that's what we're called to do. And you know, th at times, <laughs> like we talk about the distinction between we aren't striving for perfection with my team. Like we're not striving for perfection. We're not ruled by perfectionism, but what we're striving for passionately is to serve to our greatest capacity and give God our best yep. and and give him our all. And and that calls to be excellent in streaming the mass. It calls us to be excellent in picking up the phone and being personable and not having a robot pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it, it's accommodating the volume of people's interest and investment in the church and figuring out ways to to welcome that even if it's a lot mm -hmm. and and it's all about serving god and serving our neighbor with love in our hearts and and fulfilling what god is calling us to you know and and really giving our best for it you know here's another thing here's another way that the novus ordo can really again get back to what it's supposed to be and that's the liberal use of incense we do not use incense as a church as much anymore. But if you look at all of scripture from the Old Testament to the New Testament to the book of Revelation talking about incense, incense is so integral to our worship. It's again, it's it's a, it's the smoke, it's a smell, it's a sensual experience that takes somebody and takes them from the mundane or the profane and lifts their mind up. Yeah, I, lo I love Sunday, 1030 mass, we go and our pastor prayerfully is incensing the altar. And like what, what I experience while I'm watching that is his faithfulness and his marriage to the church. Mm -hmm. And, and as he's doing this, he's lifting all the prayers up of all the faithful that are there that are bringing something to the altar. It's literally preparing the space that is going to happen. Like this, this is going to happen soon. And it and it like you see the smoke going up and I and my sons are you know looking at it and I'm just like those are all of our prayers going up to God. I mean this goes back to the yeah. you know the 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 Temple of Solomon into the tent of the Tabernacles. You know yeah. I mean this is something that goes back as deep as it goes. Yeah. And it's a beautiful thing. It smells amazing. Um, and I don't know why it doesn't happen as often. You know, Father Tetlow mentions big shout out to him, rector of the cathedral down in St. Augustine, the first parish in the states, but. When he went down there, something that he, he always talks about is how he uses incense daily now, mm -hmm. and it's prepared daily. So even at the 7 a.m. Mass, mm -hmm. on a weekday Mass, they're using incense at the cathedral, and he loves it. He absolutely loves it. It's this not that hard. Yeah. You know? it, it's not hard. It's not cost prohibitive, but it's something, again, that really puts you in a time and place. Mm -hmm. And that's... In our culture that is so consuming of the mind and so distracting and so loud and noisy and so homogenized and everything looks, tastes, smells the same, mm -hmm. having a place that's something different, really separating the profane from the sacred. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have, to, you have to separate that through smell. Yeah. And incense provides that break. When we, you look at what is most evocative of, of memory, it's the sense of smell mm -hmm. so that your sense of in incense, that smell of incense, is going to populate memories associated with your prayer, your fellowship with your neighbor, serving your neighbor, serving God, listening to his word, receiving him in Eucharist, and being there with your family. You know, you think, you think about, you know, having kids, like my kids here at the church, your, your children, your biological children, you know, the hope is, is that, 40 years down the road, when when I'm not here, or 50 years down the road, when I'm not here, 
you know, they remember those celebrations, mm -hmm. and it's based on this liturgical incense that's used because they're using it 40 years from now. That's right. And it's and it's drawing up and mustering up these uh, these thoughts and memories. You know, if you smell the perfume your grandma wore, and then you smell it that's now, you'll remember your grandma immediately. That's the truth. If you smell the smell of fresh cut grass, and then you smell it in the spring, you're like, there's that smell. It's the same thing. It's again, it's about taking all the senses because we are an incarnate people. We are body, right? We have bodies. So we want our hearing through the the organ and the chant. We want our sense of smell through the um, through the incense, you know, the, the taste through the wine and the bread. Like all of our senses should be satisfied and drawn towards God in the liturgy. Mm -hmm. And the feeling of kneeling, uh -huh. you know? The, you know, the, and our bodies are absolutely entering into worship. It's, it's so true. It's, yeah. a, it's a full immersive experience. So many churches have removed their kneelers, you know, and that's... It's like a 4D movie. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's hard for me, man. Like, I, you know, I've been here for, I've been here for two well, and a half years. You get the pass because you're in a parish mission. hall. But you know, what's, you know what's church. beautiful, though? It, what's growing in practice in, in our... Because it is. It's a hall. It's an interim worship space. Um, so please help us raise funds for the building. If, you, if you're out there and want to help, please go to my website, nocateecatholic.com. Go to our fundraising section and, and please support us. But it, it still does not feel right. But what's growing in practice is people are kneeling. So mm -hmm. they're grabbing those individual kneelers and they're, they're using them. And it's, and it's growing more, you know, uh, in, in practice in, in the parish yeah. week to week. And it's a good thing. I mean, again, it, it's putting you in the posture of prayer. Now, you, everyone's like, well, they are Father, and put your hands up like this in the Iran's position. Okay, that's kind of a novelization. But the posture of prayer for the Latin church is on your knees, right, during these per certain parts of Mass. Yeah. That's a good thing. Now, look, if you're too old or you have knee problems, you're excused. Mm -hmm. No one says you have to do it. Well, what about old people? They can't do it, so no one should. No, they're excused. What about people with, you know, breathing problems from incense? Sit in the back, mm -hmm. you know. If, that, yeah. if you have a problem with it. Well, you know, there was a kid, a kid who said that he had asthma. Like we, I, I, I've been doing a lot of Eucharistic exposition with the kids. Mm -hmm. When we grew up in CCD, I mean, I, never I didn't, had. I never had that. You know, so you know, I'm, I'm putting incense. I'm explaining the thurible, the mm -hmm. monstrance, the Eucharist. This is the source and summit of our faith. And this one kid comes up. He's like, Father, I have asthma. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of worried about it. So I said, well, buddy, I, I have asthma too. Like, and, and there's certain things that bother me. Sometimes cigarette smoke bothers me or different things bother me. I said, the, the incense somehow, it, it, never, it never bothers me. So why don't, you, why don't you give it a try and just kind of be in the, if you feel sick, you know, if you don't, if you feel bad, you can't breathe, step out. And, you know, by the end of the adoration, he was right next to my side, mm -hmm. uh, you cool. know? And here's the like eight year old kid and and he was all into the incense, you know, at that at that point, you know, and it, it's it is it's there's a there's a a beautiful mystic, yeah, mystical it experience. Is. It doesn't that. smell like anything else, right? It doesn't. It doesn't. Well, this kind of brings us to our last one here, which is the altar rails. I think is you know we've started talking about kneeling and mm -hmm. reverence, like the institution of the altar rail in my parish. The has <laughs> in spades. You have seen a reverence for the Eucharist like no other. Amen. I have not. I've s literally seen this parish like transform right yeah. before my eyes. It's a more efficient system too. I it mean, is. if we're just talking practicality, yeah. it's just, it's a more efficient system of the distribution of of the Eucharist and, too. And attached to this is reverence for sanctuary, like where the sanctuary is yes. in the church. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes, like there was yes. there was kind of a weird thing where like we are church. And when when we are church, there's no epiclesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like, no order. Yeah, there's no structure. holy of holies. There's, there's, the, there's a reason it's set apart. There's a reason the priest is set apart. Yes. Yeah, and there's a reason that there used to be the iconostasis, and now yeah. the the altar rail serves that purpose. Yes, and and I would love to see altar rails come back. And yeah. it's my favorite place to pray after mass too. Like yeah, at the, yeah, that's for Thanksgiving. I, I love coming out of my pew and going all the way up to the front near the sanctuary and just spending some silent time in prayer, giving my offering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those are a couple of ways that, look, the, the Novus Order can and should be beautiful because it is the celebration of the of the highest calling of human beings, which is to celebrate the Mass and the Eucharist. And it's the most beautiful thing we do, objectively speaking. It is. Absolutely. 
So let's make it beautiful. Like, let's not, I, you know, I think a lot of the trends of the liturgical experimentation goes towards even the concept of modern art. And modern arts, its whole concept is not about beauty. It's not about classicism. It's about novelty. It's about being new. Being new is the highest calling in modern art, doing something that hasn't been done. Whether it's beautiful or good or not, it's has it been done, and if it hasn't, let's do it, and that's the virtue of it. But that in and of itself is not a virtue. All that is is a characteristic. It hasn't been done, so it must be new, which makes it art. You yeah. know what hasn't been done? What's that? There's somebody right out there that has not hit the subscribe button. Uh, and I know it's Modernist. You. Uh, <laughs> hit that subscribe button, people. Come on. Right. We, my friends, we want to just give a shout out to our patrons to say thank you for supporting us. The show would not be able to be successful without you. So if you want to be a patron and support the show, please go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N, Patreon. And there you'll see every way that you could support us, and we've got some really cool gear that we want to send your way as an action of gratitude on our part. And make sure that you're hitting us up on all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and we're so glad that you're connecting with us each week with the Catholic Talk Show. That's right. Now, before we go, two things I want to mention. Um, the first is, boys... COVID is not a thing right now when we've got a clear path to get our butts to Europe. And we're going on pilgrimage to Fatima. Yes. Finally, yeah. we get to get out of this country and go to a holy pilgrimage with, you know, people who want to go with us. We were supposed to go to the Poland. 100th birthday of John Paul II. Uh, in, yeah, and, in we didn't think, and, and we didn't think celebrating the 103rd birthday of John Paul II, <laughs> while still amazing, just doesn't have that kind of panache. But he loves Our Lady. His whole spirituality was That's built right. on the totus to us. So we're going to Fatima, and Fatima is a very important place for John Paul II. Yeah, That's right. right. So we're going to Fatima uh, this November. We're going to visit the shrine of Our Lady there and the apparition. We're going to go to Porto, the home of Port Wine. We're going to Lisbon. We're seeing all kinds of beautiful sights. Um, Father Rich, have you ever been there? Do you know, I've been to many apparition sites of Our Lady, but I've been so longing to go to Fatima my whole life because that's the only place that my grandfather went. And I wear his miraculous medal. Ooh, cool. And and he that's that's a touchstone for him spiritually. So I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. So this will be my first trip to Fatima. And I'm so glad that we get to, I get to share it with you guys yeah. and with all of our friends at the Catholic Talk Show. So yeah, going to Fatima is going to be very cool. I've never been there either, uh, but Fatima was very close to John Paul too, right? I mean, he attributes her intercession uh, for him surviving his assassination attempt. Um, but there's a lot more to do in Portugal as well. Um, and we've put together a really affordable trip. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not something that's going to break the bank. And you can go, it's actually a short flight, too. I think it's like five, six hours from New York. <laughs> that's going to be wonderful. It's, it's like, you know, for me, it's mm -hmm. shorter than flying to California, which is great, which mm -hmm. made it really attractive. But, you know, we're going to do things like uh, we're going to St. Jerome's Monastery. We're going to go to um, the Church of the Holy Miracle, which is a, a 13th century Eucharistic miracle. Uh, we're going to the shrine of Our Lady of Fatima. We're going to Porto, which is really cool. Have you, you've heard of port wine, right? Oh, of course. Well, this is where they make port wine, and there's going to be a huge uh, wine experience That's there. Gonna be cool. There's going to be great food. Um, we're going to have time also for pray and play. Prayers. That's what it's about. We're going to have time for good meals. We're going to have time for group prayer. We're going to mm -hmm. have confession. We're going to be celebrating Mass every single day. All three of us are going to be there. We're going to be your guides on this trip. Um, there's an optional extension if you want to go on over the border to Spain to the um, Via Compostela. Mm -hmm. So that's an optional thing that you can do. That's not part of the main trip, but you can add it on since you're there. Um, so go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Fatima, and you can reserve your trip. Because our last trip sold out very quick. You this did. one will sell out too. So if you want to go with us mm -hmm. to Fatima, it's very affordable. It's not a far trip. We're going just after busy season, so it's not going to be overcrowded. Yeah. We've really put together a nice experience here, and we really want you to join us. So, um, you know, go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Fatim and reserve your seat and your spot on this trip today. Absolutely. We look forward to joining you uh, on that pilgrimage. Pilgrimage is a way that you can go ever more deeper in the spiritual life. When I look at my own journey where I've really enriched my, my life with Christ in the church has been on retreat. 
and pilgrimage. And both of them uniquely have provided me such incredible experiences with sacred spaces, historical places within, you know, the Christian deposit. So we definitely want you to come out. So check it out. Go to that website, catholictalkshow.com forward slash Fatima, and we'll see you out there in Portugal. Yeah, it's going to be cool. To, I mean, we're going to be visiting the tombs of the three seers of Fatima, mm -hmm. Jacinto and Francisco Marto and um, Sister Lucia. That's cool. Yeah. I definitely want to go and, you know, venerate those saints um, there. That's going to be amazing. And to be where Our Lady appeared is mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, I also want to give a shout-out to Ave Rosary. They're one of our sponsors. Ave Rosary makes beautiful heirloom-quality rosaries that, um, you know, really elevate your experience with your rosary. So many people have, you know, mass-produced rosaries, rosaries that are almost an afterthought, right? Ave Rosary produces rosaries um, and rosary accessories that really makes your experience praying the rosary the highest it could be. Like how we were talking about how making the mass beautiful, they're trying to make the the uh, the prayer life of the rosary beautiful as well. And let's face it, you know, a lot of rosaries that are mass produced are, are produced very cheaply. Mm -hmm. You know, this is like a leather rope, you know. Petrified wood. Petrified wood, and it's like stone. And you bronze. Know? And and bronze pieces, these, these metals that are going to age with time. And the whole idea is that you're going to be passing this down from generation to generation. So you may be out there, you might have, you know, three, four young kids. Well, you know, those kids are going to pass on your mm. rosary to their children and their children's children because that's how quality these rosaries are. Yeah, you know, rosaries, a lot of times the ones you buy aren't even made by Catholics. They're not, they're made by corporations who see an opportunity for a market to it's produce a market, a good. Yeah. Yeah. Ave rosaries are made and sold by Catholics in the United States and one of the cool things that they do is every time that you buy a rosary from them, they donate a rosary to somebody in need through the CFRs in Brooklyn. So check out AveRosary.com. They've got all kinds of great rosaries. They have the Paracord rosaries, the Job's Tears rosaries, Petrified Wood rosaries. Handmade. And they have bundles with books. So, Absolutely. you know, if you if you know somebody that just passed away and and somebody's grieving, you know, mm -hmm. like they have they have phenomenal, phenomenal pastoral uh, booklets, like even the Spiritual Warfare one yep. with St. Michael. They've got great stuff. So check out AveRosary.com. Awesome. And then a big shout out for all of our Patreons. Thank you for your support. We have our Wednesday Hangouts. If you're not a Patreon, if you join, you'll get to hang out with us every Wednesday uh, where we discuss the episodes. We get to meet all the other people who are in our community. And you get cool stuff like coffee mugs and, and hoodies and Schwag. all the stuff. Swag that we like to show in our appreciation. Yeah, so absolutely. let's make the Nova Sordo great, Father Rich. I'm all about it. And I'm sure that you're all about it, too. So, you know, let's uh, let's encourage this, this uh, you know, reform. A reform in the reform. Because, mm -hmm. look, we're not going back to the Latin Mass. I'm sorry. There's, there's not going to be some savior pope who comes in and rolls back Vatican II and repeals it like this is some, you know, prohibition right. to constitutional mm -hmm. amendment. It's not going to be like that. So what we have to do is maybe take a little bit of the bumpiness that we experienced after the Vatican. Right. And now start to smooth it out and bring back in tradition where appropriate, but then also look at the benefits that, you know, the Novus Ordo has had and, and start to synthesize something that's really workable, manageable, and overall and everything reverent and beautiful. Absolutely. Well, my friends, always good to connect with you. We look forward to seeing you next week.